Okay, good afternoon everyone. Thank you very much for joining us this afternoon for the session ArcGIS Runtime Analysis. I'm joined on stage here by uh, Lucas from the ArcGIS Runtime SDK for Dot, uh, for Qt. Oh, I said Dot. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> dot Qt. Sorry. Lucas, who's a product engineer on the ArcGIS Runtime SDK for Qt, and Mark as well, Mark Baird, who's a product engineer on the ArcGIS Runtime SDK for Java. And my name's Mike Branscombe. I'm on the ArcGIS Runtime SDK for .NET. So this is one of the sessions that apply across all of the ArcGIS Runtime SDKs. Um, we'll be talking about analytical capabilities that are available to you whether you're using .NET, Java, Qt, iOS, Mac OS. Um, there may be some, uh, in a couple of cases, we'll, we'll highlight some um, potential platform differences on Windows and Linux, but otherwise everything we're talking about is available across all of the ArcGIS Runtime SDKs. So the types of uh, analysis that we'll be talking about kind of fall into these areas. Um, we are thinking about why you do analysis, lots of different reasons about understanding places, determining relationships between things. But ultimately, it's all about um, trying, to, trying to understand better the, relation, the spatial relationship between things. This is all about the science of where, really. Um, and it's things like understanding the aesthetic impact of cutting down a stand of trees. In, in a particular area of forest, or it's optimizing the transportation route for your delivery trucks to minimize environmental impact or minimize the cost on your on a business, or it's about trying to optimize the services that you provide maybe in the uh, in the community to make sure that everyone has enough access to resources. The things we'll be talking about can help you build applications to perform these types of analyses and understand these, uh, gain extra insight into these scenarios. So focusing more specifically on the types of functionality then within the ArcGIS Runtime SDK, we're talking about geometry operations, so very uh, fine-grained individual geometry operations that allow you to uh, perform analysis. Geoprocessing, so geoprocessing is a, um, a way to perform analysis and data management operations on the, the spatial data that you have. Analysis tools, so the kind of the equivalent of geoprocessing, but tools that are hosted by Esri or available to you in your enterprise portal. And visualization as a form of analysis as well. And then we'll take a look at a summary and roadmap. Okay, so first of all, I'd like to hand over to Mark, who's going to talk about geometry operations. OK, so the geometry engine is what we're going to be talking about here. Um, it's available on all of the runtime SDKs, although I'm, I'm actually going to be demonstrating this using the, uh, the Java SDK. Um, don't be offended by that if you're a .NET developer, because we've actually got a consistent design approach uh, for uh, our APIs across all of the, uh, the runtime SDKs. So the, uh, the methods and the class names that I'm going to be demonstrating are exactly the same across all of the, uh, the SDKs. There may be a, little, a few variances there, but at a high level, they are the same. So the, um, the, the geometry engine is a class uh, which, as its name suggests, is for working with geometry. Um, so geom by geometry, we mean points, lines, and uh, polygons. And these geometries are typically found inside features, inside feature classes that could be hosted in ArcGIS Online uh, or uh, ArcGIS Server or even in a, in a, even in a, uh, in a shape file. Um, and you also find them in uh, graphics uh, overlays as well. What we're talking about here is client-side processing. So this is all processing that is done very quickly and very efficiently on the, uh, the processor that's on your local machine. Now, the geometry engine, um, if you open it up, you'll see that it's got several dozen uh, methods. So in order to try to sort of break this down and explain it, um, I grouped these um, areas of functionality into uh, three different function groups. So the first one is where you can answer geometry dimension questions, and then I'm going to talk about geometry spatial questions, and then I'll finish off by um, a group of methods which enable us to be able to create new geometries. So I'll start off with the, uh, the geometry dimension questions. So this is where you can go to a line and say, how long is this line? How long is this piece of string? Um, what's the area of the polygon? What's the boundary of the polygon? What's the distance between these two points? I'm going to switch over to some Java code here, and I'm, I'm just going to go in and run this application. Um, so we've got here a, 
an interesting map and I can click on this map in a couple of points so I can accurately go to the corner of this triangle and then the other corner and it will tell me what the, uh, the distance is between those two points. Going back to the slides, the, the code that I'm running here is the distance between uh, method on the uh, geometry engine and I'm passing in the two points that I captured as I was uh, clicking on my map and I'm returning a, uh, a double uh, value which is the, uh, the planar distance. And just in general information when you're working with these methods, so the first thing you need to know is that the units that I'm returning here are in the spatial reference of the geometries that I passed in. So in this case, I was working in a map that was in Web Mercator Auxiliary Sphere, bit of a math or, but that, that works in meters. So the result that I was getting back there, um, 1300 meters, 1300 was in meters. Now the other thing that we need to know here is that the, uh, the geometries should be in the same spatial reference. So I can't pass in two different uh, geometries in different spatial references here. But if you happen to have one of the geometries in a different spatial reference, then fear not. Um, we have a method for actually dealing with that. Um, so you can project between spatial references. So um, I might be working in a map that's actually displayed in Web Mercator, but actually I, would want, I want to be able to capture points that are in a local coordinate system. Um, so a local coordinate system for me um, would be the Ordnance Survey um, British National Grid reference system. So I'm going to switch back and run another application here just to uh, demonstrate that. Now I'm looking at a map here in uh, Web Mercator, uh, but when I click on roughly where I work, my office in uh, Edinburgh, I want to get back the Ordnance Survey grid reference in the local coordinate system for me. So this is the easting and northing values that I want to be uh, working with. So I achieved that by using the project method of the geometry engine. And I passed in the, uh, the points that was in the coordinate system of the map. So this is in uh, Web Mercator. I then passed in a reference to the spatial reference that I wanted to get the data out in. So this is my Ordnance Survey Grid Reference coordinate system. And then it returned the point which was in the local coordinate system that I was interested in. Okay, so the next group of um, spatial methods we're looking at here are around answering spatial questions about the geometry. So I've got geometries and I want to find out, well, is one contained within the other? Does one cross each? Do they cross? Do they intersect? Where's the nearest vertex um, on this polygon? Do they overlap? Do they touch? Is one contained entirely within another? Let's just go and have a look at another sample we've got here. So I have an interesting map with a very boring polygon, the blue polygon here. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to click on the, uh, the map to uh, draw a line. And I'm doing a spatial operation here to work out whether it crosses. So the application I've got here will draw the polygon red if it doesn't cross, and it'll draw it green if it does. So if I just draw another line, yep, that does cross, and that crosses as well, but that doesn't. So the code I was running here in my Java application is using the geometry engine crosses method. I was passing in the, uh, the polyline that I was drawing dynamically on the screen and I was also giving it the, uh, the rectangle that was representing the uh, polygon. And that just returns a boolean value that I'm then using to set the fill symbol of the, uh, the geometry that I'm drawing on the screen. So um, I'm using a, a set color method that takes in an ARGB method here. Oops. So the final set of methods are around being able to create new geometries. Um, most common of which you may have come across already is the buffer. So this is where I can take a point, I can specify a radius, and I can draw a, uh, a circle around that. We've also got union, uh, intersects, and uh, difference. And the documentation that we've got online um, very clearly uh, describes this in these nice diagrams. Now I've got a sort of a live example of a, uh, a use for uh, intersects and buffer that I've been working on in a, uh, a, a demo that I worked on um, earlier on in the week. So 
you may have gone to an IoT session, so I'd, I'd actually planted uh, a number of uh, Raspberry Pi devices around the, uh, the conference venue. And I was actually listening in to the signal strength of uh, a few of uh, my colleagues' cell phones. Now, I was drawing a, uh, a buffer to represent where that person might be. So if I was getting a very strong signal strength, then I could draw a, uh, a small buffer. But if I was getting a very weak signal strength, I could draw a big buffer. So in the example here, I'm actually getting an equal signal strength from the, uh, the two Raspberry Pis. So I was using the intersect to work out where that particular person was at that point in time. So that's just an example of uh, how you might use the buffer and the intersects inside a runtime application. So just to summarize, it's client-side processing. Um, it's very quick, so if you've got a large number of uh, reprojects to do, which is typically quite a slow operation, um, that's something that you'd want to be doing on your CPU. So just I'll finish off by one more. Um, I've forgotten about this slide, actually. Um, just one more example. Um, imagine you've drawn yourself a, uh, a polygon, and you now want to um, draw a text marker symbol somewhere to sort of label that diagram. Well, there's a nice method here using the label point. I can pass in my uh, polygon, and it'll actually give me a, a useful anchor point for which I can actually place the label represented by the text marker symbol on my uh, application. So I'm going to hand you over now to Mike for something a little bit different, um, geoprocessing. Thank you. Four. Five. Five. Excellent. Thank you, Mark. So that's a, a great look at the geometry operations that are available to you in the ArcGIS runtime SDKs. For, so it's really fast, efficient, uh, fine-grained operations on individual geometries really uh, in a way that they're, they're stateless, I suppose. They give you back uh, new, uh, new geometries that, have been, uh, that are the result of the, the, the calculation or the computation based on those. So next we'll take a look at geoprocessing as another form of analysis available to you within the ArcGIS runtime SDKs. So geoprocessing is a, a framework and a set of tools for processing data, processing spatial data within ArcGIS generally. It's available, been available to you within ArcGIS desktop, it's available with not just Pro, not just Server, and online. There are really two, two types to think about. Spatial analysis in terms of buffer, intersect, view shed as some examples of geoprocessing tools that you might execute. And then also data management as well, so the ability to create new feature classes, add a field, um, create a geodatabase. So really two, two types of analysis. ArcGIS itself includes more than a thousand built-in tools um, that are available to you. So if you install ArcGIS Desktop, then there are a thousand plus uh, geoprocessing tools available to you within that environment. Within the ArcGIS runtime, we support a subset of those tools, around about 300 um, plus, maybe 320 geoprocessing tools. And they range across the data management, analysis, and extension areas within geoprocessing. The full list is included in the guide documentation in the ArcGIS Runtime SDKs for uh, .NET, Java, and Qt. So as well as the, the built-in tools that ArcGIS provides, you can author your own custom geoprocessing tools. So what that means is taking the built-in tools that ArcGIS provides and chaining those together in a series of operations. So it might be using um, Model Builder or Python scripts to actually chain those together to automate a series of repetitive tasks that really simplify and speed up a workflow, or maybe to solve a particularly complex problem. Your authoring environment for those custom geoprocessing tools is essentially ArcMap. Um, you're using Model Builder to visually arrange those tools on a canvas and chain them together, or you're using Python scripts in your um, favorite Python environment that ultimately, ultimately you import to a, a toolbox and use within ArcGIS Desktop. So I talked about built-in tools, the ArcGIS tools. There's an example there on the left-hand side, the Clip tool. That's an auto-generated UI that's built into ArcGIS. And then on the right-hand side is an example of a custom tool that you build where you're chaining together multiple tools. So first of all, performing a project to project the, that entire layer from one coordinate system to another, and then performing a clip to extract a, uh, or subset that data as part of your analysis workflow. So the ArcGIS runtime then works with geoprocessing via services. 
either those can be running in your ArcGIS Enterprise, um, so essentially geoprocessing services running as ArcGIS server services. That's available to all of the ArcGIS Runtime SDKs. Or there's also a component called the ArcGIS Runtime Local Server, and that can host local geoprocessing services. And it's available on Windows and Linux desktops with the ArcGIS Runtime SDKs for .NET, Java, and Qt. As I've talked about, you design those services in ArcGIS Desktop. So for the ArcGIS Runtime Local Server 100, the current release, you're using ArcMap 1041 to design those services. I talked about Model Builder and Python scripts. You then publish them as a service. So first of all, you run it within ArcGIS Desktop, and then it gets published as a service. Running the tool first within ArcGIS Desktop performs validation of the inputs, um, ensures the va uh, validation of the processing, and also of the outputs as well. So you have to get a successful execution of your custom geoprocessing tool within ArcGIS Desktop in order to be able to publish that. The result includes the input data, the output data, and any project data that was um, manipulated or accessed as part of that geoprocessing model or script that you created. And then you publish that either as a, a service on ArcGIS Enterprise, so perhaps create a service definition and upload that to the service, or you create a geoprocessing package to use with the local server. One, the reason I mention that it, uh, the result of running that within desktop includes your input data and your output data and project data is because all of that is bundled into either that service definition that, that, that is then going to get transferred to your server for publishing, or it's included within the geoprocessing package. So when you're working with these models, the one that the execution, the tool run that you want to publish, you should choose a relatively constrained uh, input data set and that will generate a relatively constrained output data set as well. Otherwise, you'll end up with uh, extremely large geoprocessing packages. And then the Runtime API, APIs provide a geoprocessing task class that allows you to work with the, uh, the service. And then job classes actually handle the specific execution of that task. The local server API also includes administration as well, because it's essentially a mini version of ArcGIS Server running on your device, accessible via the ArcGIS Runtime API. So the API includes facilities for starting and stopping the local server itself, checking the lifecycle, and also starting and stopping those services. So when you're publishing services, then the workflow is you use Model Builder or Python in ArcGIS Desktop. You create a geoprocessing package or a service definition and then publish that service either to, as an ArcGIS server geoprocessing service or as a geoprocessing package to use with the ArcGIS runtime local server. So there are some considerations for building these. These are geoprocessing tools that you create in Model Builder or Python that are going to run as a service, either on a server or locally as a local geoprocessing service. So the recommendation is to make sure you keep that input data and output data small. I talked about how otherwise it's included as a result in that service definition or the GPK, so you would effectively be unnecessarily bloating the size of that, uh, that artifact. Make sure you use data that's local to the ArcGIS server or the local server instance to avoid any uh, overhead of network traffic. There's an in-memory workspace that you can write to to avoid uh, any unnecessary overhead of writing to disk. There's um, a number of pre-processing things that you should think about as well. So adding attribute and spatial indexes. If, there's, if the type of a processing that you're performing is, is spatial and it might involve a clip or an extract or an intersect, for example, then that will benefit from spatial indexes and the, make sure those spatial indexes are the right size and appropriate for the data. Also, add attribute indexes. If you're doing any queries, selections, for example, by attribute, then they would benefit from attribute indexes as well. Avoid any unnecessary coordinate transformation. So make sure that the input data, output data, and that project data that you're using within the model or the Python script is in ideally in the same coordinate system all the way through to avoid any transformations. They would happen on each execution of that geoprocessing service and reduce the data size if you can. So potentially where data is loaded into memory, reducing that data size that's accessed during the execution of the, the process will benefit the, um, the performance. 
So let's take a look at a demo of geoprocessing them. So I'm looking at a application that I built with the ArcGIS Runtime SDK for .NET. It's a WPF application here. You can see the blue uh, dashed line indicates my area of interest. And the application allows me to define a line on the landscape and then generate an elevation profile for that. So it's making a call, pushing that line to a local geoprocessing service and using a couple of tools in the background to generate the elevation profile. So I get the uh, the altitude there in meters, sorry, this is all in metric, but uh, the altitude there in meters, and the distance along the line uh, in kilometers as well. And then if I hover over the chart, um, I'm not sure you'll be able to quite see that on, on the screens, but it's showing for that particular point on the chart, it's showing the distance along the line and also the elevation at that point as well. So they'd be considered an M value along the line and then a Z value for the altitude. So let's take a look at how I built that geoprocessing model. So I'm, I've got the same base map in ArcMap here. But what I did is take an extract for my area of interest of an elevation data set. So I've got it here with some opacity or transparency applied to that data set. So that's my area of interest. And then I wrote a Python script here. If I just edit it within, uh, choose to edit it with a notepad. So quite a simple Python script, in fact. Um, you can see that it's importing a couple of Python namespaces, ArcPy and Math, and then there's a couple of uh, input parameters that I'm getting from the, uh, from the service. So one is the input line, so that's the line that's going to be uh, interpolated across the, across the terrain, and also an input raster data set as well. My a couple of data sets that I'm generating uh, as intermediate data sets during the processing, I'm choosing to write those to in-memory workspaces. That was one of the tips that I recommended for ensuring uh, improving the performance of the geoprocessing service. And then I'm calling an, a 3D analyst function here to interpolate shape. So it's interpolating that line across the terrain. That will essentially um, add vertices into the line with Z values at each of those locations. So that how, that's how on the elevation chart I was able to show the Z value. And then I'm calling another geoprocessing tool here, create routes, which is part of the linear referencing tool set. And what that's doing is taking that line and then establishing a measure value all the way along the line. So that's how when I, I hovered over the uh, chart in the UI, I was able to see both the Z and the M values. And then finally, the script just sets the parameter back as the um, sets that geometry back as the, the output parameter. So having imported it to my toolbox, there's a couple of properties to talk about here. You saw that I had two inputs and one output, and they were being read as input zero, and the second one is input one, and then the third one being set as an output that was set as output two. So the order of those I define in here in the UI when I import my script to a toolbox. So I've got my input line features as the first one, the input raster is the second one. Those are both of type uh, of type input and their required values. And then finally, I've got the output profile as a, a feature layer or a feature set, and that's a derived output parameter. So that means when I run the when I run this tool with an Arc Map, it auto generates the UI for me, so it reads that Python script, works out. Um, or based on the parameter that I've defined when I imported that Python script, auto-generates the UI, and then gives me the option to um, define the line across the terrain. I'm waiting for um, the UI just to, to build up there. And then also define the raster, input raster data set as well. So in this case, I'm going to define I'm going to, I'm defining the raster as an input. You didn't see me when I ran the model within the final application, the WPF application to find that raster. So I'm going to actually establish that as a constant value when I produce a geoprocessing package for this. So again, the same thing, if I draw a line across the terrain there and then define my input raster as my clipped raster data set and run that geoprocessing, that's now running it within ArcMap at this point. So if we expand the, uh, the current session, we can see the interpolate shape tool is running. A 
and then when that completes, um, it will come back with a, uh, with a result. So we can see it's writing messages to the UI here. If I expand that in the result set, it's executing that geoprocessing script, and then um, the result gets added to the UI. So we can see it succeeded, and it's just building up the table of contents and added the output shape to the UI. If I open up the attribute table, the interesting thing here is you can see that it's a polyline. Maybe that's um, a little bit small on the display there, but you can the geometry type is a polyline with the Z and M values. So it's on of the Z and M values that I um, built up by calling the interpolate shape and the create route geoprocessing tools and return those as part of the geometry. Having uh, successfully executed that geoprocessing tool, then I would choose to share as a geoprocessing package because I was running a WPF application using the ArcGIS Runtime local server component in here. So I want to check the box to support the ArcGIS Runtime. And that's actually made a slight change to the, uh, the inputs over here that you can see. So by supporting ArcGIS Runtime, it's expanded the options for the input set. So I want to keep the input line features as a user-defined value because I want the user to define the line in the application. However, the input raster, I don't want the user of the user of the application to have to define a raster. So I'm going to choose a constant value in that in this case. And that just includes the raster data set within the geoprocessing package. So that input raster data set no longer becomes a required input um, as far as the successful execution of that model. And then finally, the output profile, that's just the output. Um, and then when I'm packaging my geoprocessing package within ArcMap, I would click the Analyze tool here, and that will analyze the script. And it will tell me any um, information. So it will tell me some things are missing. I haven't added tags or a summary. So there's a, a good practice. But also, it tells me down here some licensing information as well. So in the prepare window, it tells me that I need um, standard license with the geoprocessing deployment and also 3D analyst. So the create routes tool requires a standard license and the interpolate shape requires a 3D analyst um, or the analysis extension license for ArcGIS runtime. So you get information while you're building up your geoprocessing model to create a geoprocessing package about the deployment licensing, <coughs> licensing that you need as well. So having created the GPK then, let's take a look at the, look at the code and just see how I use that. So I'm working with the ArcGIS Runtime API. I've referenced in terms of .NET, I've referenced a couple of NuGet packages here, I've referenced the WPF API itself, and then also the Local Services API. That provides me with this class Local Geoprocessing Service, and that the constructor for that takes a string, which is a path to a geoprocessing package, and then I choose the execution type, so there's either synchronous or asynchronous, there's documentation on what that, what that means, but that provides you with additional monitoring options for the service. But in this case, it's a quick service to execute in the client application, so I've chosen uh, to be synchronous. I start the service, create a new geoprocessing task using the URL and the endpoint to that, which is interpolate shape. And then in the next section of code here, I'm taking a user input, so I'm using the sketch editor um, to capture the line. across, And then there's some work to do to build up the input. So I'm doing a projection between the coordinate system of the map, which is Web Mercator, and the um, Miller coordinate system, which my raster data set is in. I request that I want Z and M values returned from the service, which again allows me to uh, show those points on the chart. Add that to a feature collection table, which is my input. Um, add the feature to the table, and then finally, this line, just a one line call to get the result of the geoprocessing job. So that geoprocessing job hands off the execution to the local runtime local server. That performs the processing, and then I get the result back, and then I can just iterate over the result set. And eventually what I want to do is build up a collection of points that I will bind to the, the chart. And then finally, the total distance. I just get the last point and, um, and perform some rounding of the, uh, of the distance there. So that's kind of an end-to-end, -end, a, writing a Python script and ArcMap, creating a geoprocessing package, and then using that to build an application. 
let's take a look at analysis tools now. So we've talked about geometry engine, geoprocessing tools. I'd like now to talk about analysis tools. And these are essentially, you can think of them as prepackaged geoprocessing services that are hosted by your portal um, or by Esri on ArcGIS Online. So ArcGIS provides a number of pre-built analysis services. The ArcGIS runtime is just a client application to these services, so you work with them via the API. They're categorized by data type. Typically, when you, when you go away after the session and look at the documentation, you'll see there's a distinction between uh, feature analysis and raster analysis. So feature analysis is, has a number of operations, aggregate points, uh, buffer, watershed, and those are available both in, um, in your ArcGIS portal, an ArcGIS enterprise, or an ArcGIS online as well. There's also additional options with some of the extensions to ArcGIS Enterprise. So the GeoAnalytics server allows you to perform feature analysis against big data, and also with the added dimension of time as well. So with, with the GeoAnalytics server extension, it supports a subset of the feature analysis tools that are already available to you with Portal, but it's really about working with big data in, a, in the data store, and then also adding that extra element of time as well. And then there's also raster-based analysis, so calculating density, slope, view sheds, for example. So these are raster-based analysis services enabled by the image server extension. And there's a link there on the slides. Um, the slides will all be available afterwards to understanding analysis in Portal for ArcGIS, so detailed documentation about the different analysis types where the operations are available to you. So let's take a look at using one of these analysis tools within the ArcGIS runtime then. So I'm looking at the area around Palm Springs again, and in this case, what I'm going to do is just click on, on the map, tap on the map to define an area. Now it's going to ask me to sign in. So this is an analysis tool that's hosted in a portal. I'm actually using my uh, developer portal in this case. I have a, um, effectively a, a portal available to me um, as a, an ArcGIS developer. So I'll just log in. And I'll check the box to remember my credentials. So the control you actually see here is a control that we've, it's um, a WPF UI that we've built and included within the beta toolkit that we've just pushed up as a NuGet package for the ArcGIS runtime SDK for .NET. It's um, that authentication UI works out what type of challenge you get from the content that you're trying to access and then displays the appropriate UI for logging in. And you can see the watershed for the Tickets Creek goes, is quite a large watershed, goes all the way up to the, the peak of San Jacinto, so quite a large area. And that might be part of an analysis workflow where I'm trying to understand if I detect um, some pollution, what was the watershed, what are the potential sources for this pollution in Tickets Creek. Let's take a look at how I built the how I built that tool then. So I talked about how the first of all I'm authenticating with um, a portal, so I'm actually logging into my mbranscom um, maps.artgest.com. So you could do this equivalent as an ArcGIS developer and consume some of the credits you get with your developer subscription. And then using the portal info helper services URL, I get back the hydrology service URL for my portal, so it was actually running on, a, on another server, and I'm going to use the watershed operation on there. There's some initialization here, where I'm adding graphics overlays to my, uh, graphics overlays to my map view in order to display the, both the input point and the resulting watershed. And then I use the sketch editor again, in this case, just to capture the tap point from the user and then in this case, it's actually an asynchronous service. But at the same process, I build up a collection, of, a collection of features. In this case, there's one feature. Set the input geometry, add that to the table, create my uh, geoprocessing parameters, create a geoprocessing job. And then finally, again, um, here I'm just a one-line call to await the results of that geoprocessing. And eventually, that, that came back as a as an output, and then I can just get the geometry as a polygon and add that to my graphics overlay.
Okay, so that was a look at geoprocessing and analysis tools as well. I'd like to hand over to Lucas now for a look at visualization. All right. So now that we've looked at some of the most common and traditional ways to do analysis in ArcGIS Runtime, I just want to take a step back and remind everyone that sometimes a simple visualization is all you really need to tell a story or to answer a question. Similar to how graphs and charts help tell something about your data, looking at a map can help us better understand what our data is actually saying. So visual analysis allows us to quickly detect patterns, trends, and outliers in our data. For example, you might notice one particular area that has a really high rate of infectious disease, or maybe you see a trend in the direction and the speed that an epidemic's moving throughout a state or something like that. You're not gonna necessarily find statistical significance or correlations or anything like that through visualization, but you can explore the information and pick out things you might not otherwise notice. Um, visualization is also a form of discovery and data exploration. And when you're building interactive applications, especially with ArcGIS Runtime, it's greatly enhanced by using tools like a swipe tool or charts or toggling layers on and off. This allows you to quickly compare information and explore data in a way that's kind of difficult to do with geoprocessing or geometry, which require very deliberate decisions about what data you want to compare. And finally, visual data, uh, visual analysis can be done on raster or vector data. Vector data is commonly used in choropleth maps to show some statistics like population by county. Um, and raster uh, renders allow you to do things like display hill shades for a DEM depending on the azimuth and altitude of the sun. So for visualizing vector data, uh, we're talking about typically applying symbols based on rules. And the rules are usually applied to feature attribute data values. Um, one of the most common renders used is a unique value render. And unique value renders allow you to display different symbols per unique attribute value in the data. So maybe you want to map uh, the favorite sports team in a state or something like that. You could use a unique value render for that scenario. Second most common uh, Visual, visual, uh, visualizing vector data uh, render is the class breaks render, and that allows you to display a different symbol per range of attribute values. So maybe you want to look at median income by county. And finally, there's smart mapping renders, and we're adding more and more of these into ArcGIS runtime. Currently, we support visual variables, and visual variables allow you to visualize multiple data values by applying different colors, transparency, and rotation. So think about um, in the plenary, you saw weather stations with arrows, and you might see the size change based on how strong the wind is, and the direction of the rotation change based on which direction the wind is blowing. It's a way to display multiple things about the data in just one symbol, so that's really powerful. Um, we'll be adding heat map support in, uh, I believe, update two for ArcGIS runtime as well. So I'll do a little example to show you the power of visualization for um, this simple map here. So in this scenario, let's say I'm a business owner and I'm interested in um, finding aging populations because I do in-home health care. So I'm looking at counties here in ArcGIS Online. I've got some data in here, like demographics. Um, I've got race, male, female, age, and I've got median, median age in here. So let's start by selecting an attribute I want to display. Go to median age. And by default, ArcGIS Online gives me a nice looking map, but it's not entirely clear which counties I would want to focus on as a business owner. So if I click on the options here, I can start manipulating this visualization a bit. So let's say I want to really accentuate the aging population. I can increase to the median, the, the, the lowest value in the color ramp to the median age. You can see I start to see a bit more trends in the data. I'll go ahead and change to this color ramp. 
And with visual variables, I can, again, add transparency, rotation, and other variables uh, so I can display more than just the age. So for example, let's say I want to focus on rural areas. I don't want to focus on highly populated areas. I can make areas uh, with higher population more transparent. So I'll scroll down to the population, 2012. I'll make the higher populated areas almost completely transparent. And the lower populations with only 5% transparency. And you can see here, we've got some standout counties like in New Mexico or Arizona. So since ArcGIS Runtime works seamlessly with web maps, I can author my data in ArcGIS Online, copy the web map URL, and put it into my ArcGIS Runtime app. So here I'm using Qt Creator, and I'm constructing a new map. The constructor takes a URL to a web map, pass that in, build it and run it. You can see I have a simple vector map here, and I can click and do an identify and show the information about the county in a callout. So it's a pretty simple scenario, but you can imagine how this visual analysis will allow me to further dive in later with maybe some geoprocessing or geometry operations to further explore some of these areas we found through doing visualization. Okay, so you can also apply renders to raster data and, and find new information about raster data through using renders. We support Hillshade, we support uh, Blend Render, RGB, Stretch, and Color Map Render. Hillshade renders allow you to uh, visualize shaded relief in grayscale, so that's what you're looking at on the slide here. Blend Render actually inherits from Hillshade Render, so it's a form of Hillshade Render, but it also applies terrain shading on top of that, so that gives you a nice textured look. Um, stretch Render allows for rendering continuous data with a gradual ramp of colors. RGB is similar to Stretch, but it's used for multiband, so that's great for imagery. And Color Map can be used for rendering discrete data like land use and land cover. So I'll jump into another demo here. So in this scenario, I'm a park manager in Hawaii, and we've recently had uh, a lot of rain, for example, and maybe a lot of the trails are kind of washed out, and they're potentially areas that hikers could get stranded. I've marked some of the particularly problematic areas in red X's in graphics. And as I move my sun around, it changes the azimuth of the hillshade. And this would help me understand a question like, where would I where would I land a helicopter um, if I had to do a rescue mission? Where would be the areas that would be really shaded or which areas would be in full sun? I can also apply the blend render and see the elevation. So the areas in the orangish reddish color are higher elevation. So I can see this area in the middle is close to a particular, particularly uh, steep drop off so that may be difficult to do uh, a rescue operation. Whereas over here, we're at some higher elevations and I've got some nice flat areas. So this is an example of how you can use visualization to look at your data differently than what it might look like at the surface. And that's using raster renders. So I'll pass it back to Mike to close us out. Okay, thanks, Lucas. Um, um, a great look there at using visualization as a form of analysis within the ArcGIS runtime. So ArcGIS runtime enables analysis in your native apps. So it's all about embedding um, GIS analysis into applications that you're building to run on devices either in the field or in the 
uh, in the enterprise. It's also, we talked about a number of different approaches, geometry engine, geoprocessing, online analysis tools, uh, visualization, but it's important not to think about those as standalone workflows. All of the <clears throat> approaches can be combined to generate entire analysis workflows. So it's very common to, for example, to combine geometry engine to do some manipulations of specific geometries, perhaps a project, use that as the input to a geoprocessing operation, and then use the visualization capabilities to understand different aspects of the resulting data when it comes back from the geoprocessing operation. Many of the forms of analysis that we've taken a look at today can run local to the device. So they can run directly within the ArcGIS runtime. Mark talked about, for example, Geometry Engine as very fast uh, synchronous operations that are all happening client side. We took a look at geoprocessing using local server that could run in a disconnected environment and of course visualization as well. So they can support offline workflows but still provide great analytical capabilities. But they can also run in the enterprise or in the cloud as well. So using online services based either geoprocessing, analysis tools, for example, or visualizing data coming from a service. And then roadmap for analysis in ArcGIS Runtime 100. So for the local server, the ArcGIS Runtime local server, we'll be adding some additional geoprocessing tools. Really, that the list of additional tools that we add is determined by you. So the feedback that we get from you about tools that you need within the ArcGIS Runtime local server to do complete your geoprocessing workflows, we welcome that feedback from you. We'll be supporting additional renderers and uh, extra support for smart mapping capabilities from the platform as well. So Lucas talked about a number of renderers that are available to you. We'll be enhancing those over time in the ArcGIS runtime. And then also, one of the areas that's more research-based at the moment is 3D uh, on-the-fly visual analysis. So operations such as ViewShed and Line of Sight, being able to perform those dynamically in real time in response to user action. Um, it's not really persisting any results on disk in comparison to, say, geoprocessing, but it provides very fast, very efficient uh, analytical capabilities. Okay, so with that, thank you very much for attending the session this afternoon. Um, oh, have we got another demo? No way, we've got, hold on, stop, sit down. We've got another demo. All right, we'll show you, I'll be really quick. Uh, we've got a couple of network analysis uh, tasks that we're adding support for at update one. The first one's closest facility. Um, so here I'm looking at a mobile map package that I created in ArcGIS Pro. The little heart symbols are hospitals and the pins are school locations. So maybe in this example, you'd want to know the closest hospital to a given school. If I kick off the task, that'll send the facilities, which are my hospitals, and the incidents, which are my schools, up to the server. That'll compute the uh, closest one and also give me the geometry for the route back, and that's what I'm displaying uh, on the map here. The code for that is gonna follow the same task pattern that you see throughout the, the ArcGIS runtime, where you create the task, you wait for it to load, you then obtain the default parameters, um, set additional parameters and solve the task. And one more for you, we are going to be supporting the service area. And so the service area is used to define uh, service areas or drive times around a given location. So this can help businesses um, maybe identify holes in the market or maybe if you're a city planner, you wanna find the areas that don't have access to a park. In this example, we've got, um, we've got farmer's markets around the area of San, uh, San Diego. And if I click that, I can see some of the areas that don't have access within a 20 minute drive to get to farmer's markets. So either as a business person or as a city planner, I might be able to identify areas that I want to target. So those are two of the network analysis tasks that we're adding at update one. Those work online, and then with update two, it'll be working completely offline as well. And that's all I've got, Mike. Cool. Thank you. So just on the roadmap then, um, a late, late breaking addition, net, additional network analysis capabilities, uh, closest facility and service area that you saw. Lucas 
said we'll have an online closest facility and service area support in update one, and then support for offline disconnected workflows with closest facility and service area coming in update two. And with that, thank you very much for coming along to the session this afternoon. We can take some questions now, or I suppose there's also the party. You can take. Might be less keen to take questions at the party. Okay.